Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the clinical trials portion of the podcast where we're about to discuss the FAM1 and FAM2 clinical trials. Now, I can tell you that I've waited a long time to review both of these clinical trials. FAM2, highly anticipated clinical trial, published last month, September 13, 2012, New England Journal of Medicine. So we're definitely going to discuss FAM2, but first, FAM. And it's hard to believe that only three years have gone by since the FAME study, which came out in January 2009. And in that very important manuscript, the following conclusion was made. Here it is from FAME. Routine measurement of FFR in patients with multivessel CAD who are undergoing PCI with drug-looting stents significantly reduces the rate of the composite endpoint of death, non-fatal MI, and repeat revascularization at one year. Okay, so FFR guided approach. So let's break that down. FAME took 1,005 patients who underwent angiography and were about to undergo PCI with drug eluting stents because of multivessel disease. But first, they randomly assigned those people to one of two groups. Group one was PCI with drug eluting stent guided only by angiography. And group number two was PCI with drug eluting stents guided by angiography followed by an FFR of 0.8 or less. FFR, fractional flow reserve. If you don't know it, you have to look it up. So group two will get less stents because some of those patients, I'm sorry, some of those lesions are going to have an FFR greater than 0.8. So those won't get stented, but anything less than 0.8 will. And which group did better? Group two. So fame is telling us this. It's telling us that less is better. And I'll say this all again. In fame, 1,005 people underwent angiography before randomization. Lesions, quote, requiring stenting, unquote, were identified in those 1,005 patients. Then, before undergoing routine PCI, they divided those people into two groups. Group one, you stent the lesion that, quote, required stenting, unquote. Group two, you first perform FFR on all the lesions that, quote, required stenting, unquote. And the lesions that get stented are only the ones that have an FFR less than 0.8. Therefore, the FFR guide PCI approach is going to get less stents. So that should make sense. And the outcome, the FFR guided group did better with respect to the primary outcome. So bottom line, less is better. Now for a quick summary of the FAME results, the mean number of lesions indicated for stenting in group one, the group with angiography only, 2.7 2.7 lesions. So 2.7 lesions that appeared to need stenting by angiography alone. And group two, the angiography group followed by FFR, 2.8 lesions. Okay, that makes sense because the lesions were determined by angiography alone. Next, the mean number of stents deployed. So the group with angiography only, they had 2.7 stents deployed. The group with angiography followed by FFR, only 1.9, and that's a p-value of 0.0001, okay, so significant. Next, the one-year event rate, so composite of death, non-fatal MI, or repeat revascularization, the group with angiography only, 18.3%, and the group with angiography followed by FFR, just 13.2%, so lower in the FFR-guided group, p-value 0.02, that did meet significance. So therefore, the number of patients needed to perform FFR on is 20. So 18.3% minus 13.2% is about 5% difference. So 1 divided by 0.05 is 20. They do give the number needed to treat in the study. Now, the number of patients needed to perform FFR on is going to be different than the actual number of times you have to perform FFR. So remember that each patient underwent FFR on an average 2.8 times. So take 2.8 by 20 and that's 56. So that's quite a lot of work for the interventionalist. Now, other important points about FAME, the inclusion criteria, ready? Now, this is a little weird. So FAME included multivessel CAD defined as stenosis of 50% or greater in at least two of the three major coronary arteries, and PCI had to be indicated. Now, FAME also says this. So listen carefully. So patients with recent myocardial infarction could be included could be included, important wording there, for STEMI patients greater than five days out. So if you had a STEMI six days ago, you could be included seven days ago, eight, but not if you had a STEMI two days ago, okay? And then also, N-STEMI patients, they could be included as well. 
And they can be included within five days as long as the total CK was less than 1,000 IUs per liter. Now, the results don't explicitly tell us how many of these patients had periprocedural MIs. At least, I'm not seeing it anywhere. But it was estimated from other sources who also could not find this data that about 7.5% of patients had periprocedural MIs. Now, unstable angina is reported in the tables, and roughly 30 to 35% of the patients were given a diagnosis of unstable angina. So FAME 1 exclusion criteria, here we go, left main coronary artery disease, previous cabbage, cardiogenic shock, extremely tortuous or calcified arteries, a life expectancy less than two years, pregnant, or any contraindication to stent placement. Okay, five-year results for FAME still await as of today, October 2nd, 2012. Now, worst part of FAME for me, I did not like the whole inclusion criteria thing. So I didn't like that they included both ACS patients and stable CAD patients. So for me personally, I like when they stick to one or the other, i.e. we have a population of either all ACS patients or population of all stable CAD patients. So that way, I, I find it easier to take the results of a study like this and apply them to a patient that I'm caring for on the wards that either has ACS or doesn't. So this makes it a bit more difficult to prognosticate outcomes when you have studies that include both ACS and non-ACS. Uh, furthermore, it was a bit sloppy in terms of having to find the actual numbers of MI in the paper. Again, I didn't find the number of MIs explicitly mentioned. They did give numbers for unstable angina, however. All right, best part. So the best part for me uh, in fame is the outcome of the study. So showing that better outcomes could be achieved with the use of fewer stents. So very important for several reasons, because not only do we, uh, we get better uh, patient outcomes here, but it should hopefully lead to lower cost given less stents. Now, I think total procedure time was about the same too. I don't actually have that data in front of me. Okay, so that's FAME. Now we're going to discuss FAME 2. And this is the study that I've been waiting so long for. So FAME 2, September 13, 2012, New England Journal of Medicine. And this came to us courtesy of the FAME trial investigators, led by first author Bernard De Bruyne. St. Jude Medical, who played a huge role in supporting the trial, and all the clinical sites that participated and contributed, of course, and just a huge effort. And again, this all coming to us just three years since FAME 1 in 2009. So FAME 2 stands for Fractional Flow Reserve Guided PCI versus Medical Therapy in Stable CAD. So unlike FAME 1, FAME 2 is now looking at Stable CAD. Now, while I was reading this manuscript, I couldn't help but think that the authors were really understating the importance of this trial. They seemed to be very safe in the way they worded things, um, and, but hopefully the results can speak for themselves. Now, here's the background. Background of FAME 2. PCI had never been shown to improve mortality in patients with stable CAD, and that's important. We all know about the COURAGE trial that PCI was no better than optimal medical therapy alone in terms of a mortality benefit, and that PCI really only helped uh, temporarily with angina. So I have to pause here and say one thing about the COURAGE trial before getting back to FAME 2. In the COURAGE trial, everyone got cath, and lo and behold, there were about 1,000 people with left main disease, about 3% of the initial 35,000 screened, and those 1,000 people with left main disease got excluded. In fact, only about 2,300 of 35,539 people got randomized in COURAGE, okay? So that's the reason that it's hard to apply the COURAGE trial to real-life practice. You just, you don't know which one of your patients has left main versus those that don't, okay? COURAGE, they knew. So I'm not discrediting the COURAGE trial anyway. It's just an inherent limitation of trials like this. Now back to FAME 2. So background of the study, that PCI is no better than optimal medical therapy in treating stable CAD. In FAME 1, we had an FFR-guided approach that was better than PCI. And that sets the stage for the question that's going to be asked in FAME 2. If FFR-guided PCI 
is better than PCI alone without FFR, then that begs the question, is FFR-guided PCI going to be better than optimal medical therapy? And that is the question that's being asked in FAME 2. So let's go straight to the results. The primary endpoint was a composite endpoint, death, MI, and urgent revascularization. So very similar endpoint as in FAME 1. Group 1, an FFR-guided PCI approach, this had a 4.3% event rate. Group 2, medical therapy alone, had a 12.7% event rate. Now, because the difference was so striking, the DSMB stopped the trial prematurely. And that difference was mainly driven by a lower rate of urgent revascularization in the FFR-guided PCI group, just 1.6%, compared to 11.1% in the optimal medical therapy group. Now, of important interest, most of those in the optimal medical therapy group who underwent urgent revascularization, they had ACS, most of them. Also, quality of life was better in the FFR-guided PCI group versus optimal medical therapy alone, and that's very important because Ultimately, what we're trying to do for our patients is improve their outcomes, and they don't necessarily see this in terms of hard endpoints like death or MI, but rather from a quality of life perspective. Now, as pointed out by IJ uh, Curtinay, an interventionalist at Columbia Presbyterian, is that we don't typically randomize patients that are going to have a death or MI benefit. So for example, a patient with a 99% left main lesion, we don't randomize because we know revascularization clearly helps. So his point is that the focus on death or MI may be somewhat short-sighted unless those really sick patients were to be randomized, but we just don't randomize them. And apparently the ischemia trial is trying to do that, okay? So the study details of FAME2, we should go through that quick. The study enrolled 1,220 stable patients with suspected CAD and examined their coronaries using fractional flow reserve. Everybody got cath. Now, patients with at least one lesion having an FFR less than 0.80 were then randomized to either PCI or optimal medical therapy. So again, 1,220 stable CAD patients with with, uh, suspected CAD, they were examined using FFR. Everybody got cath. Everybody got FFR. And patients with at least one lesion having an FFR less than 0.80 they were randomized to either PCI or optimal medical therapy. And it turns out that 888 of the 1,220 patients had at least one flow-limiting lesion defined as an FFR less than 0.8. So those 888 patients were randomized, and the remaining patients entered a registry. And the registry is a very important thing because we get data from that as well, right? So if the patients in the registry do well, we can be reassured that excluding those with an FFR greater than 0.8 is okay. And so far, that has been the case. Now, if those patients ended up all dying, we'd have to go back and ask ourselves, is 0.8 a legitimate cutoff or do we need to increase that? Okay, so the outcomes, once again, FAME 2, Group 1, the FFR guide PCI, they had a 4.3% event rate. And remember, that's a composite of death, MI, and urgent revascularization. Group 2, medical therapy alone, they had a 12.7% event rate. The trial was halted early by the DSMB, and that's about it. I don't have a whole lot to add other than that. Uh, Worst part for me in FAME 2, clearly it was the fact that the Data Safety Monitoring Board stopped the trial early. You simply don't know what ultimately would have happened, and had this been a longer study, perhaps it would have revealed a mortality or MI benefit in the FFR-guided PCI group. However, we will never know because the trial was halted early. Now, the best part of FAME 2 for me is just the entire relatively new concept of evaluating ischemia. So it's turning out that it appears that FFR is is evaluating true ischemia, whereas previously PCI was guided by the angiographic appearance of lesions. So in a two-dimensional plane, uh, sort of an eyeball test. So I like the fact that we have new technology on the table This isn't another antiplatelet ACS trial. It's not another drug-eluting stent trial. We're talking about relatively new and exciting technology. So best part for me, hands down, is the novel concept of these studies, FAME 1 and FAME 2. So that wraps up FAME 1 and the FAME 2 trials. 
constantly impressive all the way through. I highly recommend you read at least Fame 2, as this will likely be the enduring study that we hear about years down the road or until the next big thing is invented. So, until next time, so long. (laughs) 